everyone. I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to another session of my happiness hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. If this is your first time joining us, we do this every Wednesday night live here on Zoom with a new topic and a new speaker. To check out the list of upcoming presentations, I post those on Tuesday to my Instagram page at Cousin Linda and on my website, lindanickel.com. There's a lot more description on those classes at my website, so if you've missed a presentation, you can also find those linked to YouTube from my website. Tonight, our guest is Ruth Hoyt, a wildlife photographer, instructor, guide, and a writer from deep south Texas. Ruth's images have been published by National Geographic, The Nature Conservancy, Texas Monthly, the Texas Wildlife Association, and that's just to name a few. She's also had the honor of having her images exhibited by the Smithsonian Institute of America. So if you've ever photographed birds, you're probably going to agree with me that they are a tough subject when they are perched on a stick and even more difficult when they are in the air. So I asked Ruth to share her tips on photographing birds in flight. So if you didn't know, Ruth also hosts her own Zoom meetups on the third Sunday of every month. So be sure to check out her Instagram page for more information. So Ruth, I wanna welcome you back. Um, thank you for, for coming and uh, this is your second time with us. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here. And I guess the first thing I need to do is share my screen, right? I thought I would share some birds in flight photos before we really start. And so um, I have a white-tailed hawk, a buff-bellied hummingbird. Those are both valley specialties. Uh, Red-winged blackbirds can be found almost everywhere, but we have them down here for part of the year at least. And green jay, one of my favorite birds to photograph. I love the way they, uh, they're very uh, flamboyant, let's just say. Their personalities and the way they fly, everything about them I love. And oh, I think maybe should I have an alternate title for things with wings? Mm -hmm. uh, I like to photograph lots of things with wings, but for tonight we're going to focus on the birds. So I've got some tips for birds in flight photography to share with you. And before we begin, I would like to say that you should learn about your subject first. You don't want to just go blasting out into the uh, outdoors ready to go, you think, but not knowing anything about your subject. And you should also learn about ethics and appropriate techniques. Uh, we don't want to hurt the birds. We don't want to hurt their chances for survival. Um, that's the last thing we want to do. Everybody loves wildlife, and so we want to learn about the right things to do and not to do to, to ensure that you don't hurt them. So let's cover four considerations, camera gear, camera settings, in the field photography, and uh, photography from a blind. And we can answer questions in between each section if you like. So as for camera gear, the usual look of a bird photographer's tripod and lens is intimidating if you haven't seen it before. It's a huge lens with a camera attached and a tripod. The tools I use as a bird photographer, um, well, we're gonna talk about the tripod and telephoto lenses that I use. So I have a Gitzo carbon fiber tripod. It's a great support system and it's lightweight. A Wimberly gimbal head that supports that big lens. So there you have the, the, the big lens plus the camera. The 600 millimeter lens is what I use currently but I still have my 500 millimeter lens. I love my 300 millimeter lens. Uh, it's a 2.8 lens, it's a very fast lens. It gathers lots of light and gives you fast shutter speeds. And I use a 100 to 400, but not as much as the others. And also 70 to 200. The 70 to 200 is a much shorter lens. Uh, you would use it for very large birds or mammals, um, but it's not the one that I gravitate toward, but it's another one that you can carry in the field. But you don't have to buy all this stuff. It has taken me a long time to accumulate it. Um, 
I started, well, I've been teaching photography for more than 30 years now. So it's taken a while to accumulate it because trust me, I don't have a budget to go out and just buy all the new stuff. So let's talk about camera settings. I photograph in manual mode about 95% of the time. My preferred settings are ISO 800, F8, and 1 2500th of a second. And that's for moving subjects. If you are working on birds before they take off or after they've landed, I don't mind going to 1 500th of a second, but that's not going to cut it when you're doing birds in flight, unless you're panning. Okay, so let's talk about that hawk. Here are my camera settings. There we go, we have those, uh, those uh, settings that I was just talking about. 1 2500th of a second at F8, ISO 800, and this was with my 500 millimeter lens. It is cropped, but not a lot. Uh, I got that one from a photo blind and the hawk was getting ready to bank and he turned his head and was just looking toward us. So that's, um, that's what you have on that one. Uh oh, what did I do? Okay. Um, this is a buff bellied hummingbird. And it's a resident bird that's here year round, but I don't get to, to photograph it much because I don't feed them at my uh, house. The camera settings are 32 hundredth of a second at F5, ISO 800 using the 500 millimeter lens. Now you can use a much shorter lens and do just as well. It just so happens that that's how I was set up the day that I was doing it. I didn't, uh, I was still I guess you would say learning and practicing, and I didn't bring my 300 millimeter lens with me. So that, that only meant that I just needed to work from a farther distance back. The red-winged blackbirds, those are scrappy birds and they will fight over food. So I try and get that nice fast shutter speed. I got 32 hundredth of a second. My lens is open a little bit more and the ISO stays the same and the lens is the same, the, eight, the 500 millimeter. Here we have a green jay. Um, this is the only shot from the series that worked uh, because the next second he, he was, his head was down too far. But when you're working uh, with birds in flight, again, you want that fast shutter speed. I have my camera on motor drive, so I'm taking, well, up to 15 frames per second, so it's very fast. And here I had ISO 1600, and I was using the 300 millimeter lens and I cropped. When I'm doing uh, the birds in the, on the ranch and the cactus and uh, trying to get flight shots, I generally switch to my 300 millimeter lens because it gives me a little bit more room to get more shots in before the, the bird either lands or, or veers away or fights or whatever the action is that I'm trying to capture. Okay, yeah, I, I have to show this wasp because, you know, a lot of times when you're sitting in a photo blind, if there's no birds there, but it's hot and you're thinking of leaving, if you'll notice on the water, there are wasps and this is a good place to practice. I know if you're going to photograph birds, you have to practice on birds, but it's also good to photograph these guys because they land, they drink, and then they're gone. So it gets you uh, good practice on getting on your subject, getting it in the viewfinder, getting it focused, and then start shooting. So here we have that fast shutter speed, 32 hundredth of a second at F5, ISO 800, and yes, it's with the 500 millimeter lens. I sometimes will put an extension tube, not an extender, but an extension tube to be able to focus a little bit closer on these guys. When I'm sitting in the photo blind and I'm using my 500 millimeter lens, I can't photograph the ones that are um, closer to me because the lens just won't focus that close, even with the extension tube. But all the way across on the other side, I can. So I like doing that. It's a good practice uh, technique. So uh, one thing I'm going to say is that technology has changed. I've been doing uh, photography Oh gosh, let's not count the years. You know I've been teaching 30 plus years. So I started back in the dark ages of film and technology has changed. We've moved from film to digital and mirrorless is coming around the corner as we speak. So technology has changed and I would like to introduce Topaz software. It is a game changer. I just started using it recently and fell in love with it. Um, I've got some examples that I have done in Topaz 
uh, I open my Lightroom, look at my picture, and before I do anything else, I go into AI Denoise or AI Sharpen. De the AI stands for Artificial Intelligence, which is how this uh, software is designed, and Denoise does exactly that. It helps get rid of the noise, and it has a Sharpen feature in it. AI Sharpen sharpens your pictures. If you didn't quite get it tack sharp, you may be able to rescue it. And the AI Sharpen also has a feature in it for denoise. So you can, you can actually use both parts of uh, one of these when you're working with your pictures. Let's look at a couple of pictures. Okay, this picture is a, a picture of a cardinal uh, male feeding the female. Actually, I think they were just kissing. I don't think he had any food, but anyway, she reached up and he, he reached down to her. And if you look at the settings, it's a 25 hundredth of a second at F63, which is you know pretty normal, but I was on ISO 6400. You really cannot tell that this was a super high ISO. So that one was with my 600 millimeter and I cropped. So you're not even seeing the whole picture. Let's look at the next one, similar thing. I've got a green jay. He's not quite in flight, but you might as well say he is. He's leaving the perch. Not my favorite shot, but I'm using it as an example for you to see. You're not gonna, well, maybe you will believe it uh, if you've used Topaz. I put the camera to ISO 12,800. That's just unheard of. Um, well, not quite unheard of. Nowadays with Topaz, you can do this. So I really like um, using that software because you can, uh, crank up your ISO and still have your fast shutter speed and you're going to get a picture. I have to say that the, the the day I was photographing this green jay was super, super dark, cloudy. The, the sky was real dark, but I was trying anyway. I was, um, I was there with somebody who wasn't photographing and she was curious about the photography. So I went ahead and set up my camera. All right, this one I have, um, well, here you can see I've numbered it one. If you can see the top right of your screen, it says number one. This is number one, this is number two. And you may not see a difference. There's one, two, one, two. You may not see a difference, but let's go in for a closer look. Number one was unedited. So this is right out of the camera. All I've done is crop it. Number two is using uh, Topaz Sharpen. I don't know, it, you know, there's number one unedited, there's number two. I know that's really hard to see the difference between the two, so I cropped in more. This is the unedited version, it's number one, and you can see it's definitely not a sharp picture. It's, it's just not in focus. There it is with Topaz Sharpen. And it may not be a perfect picture, but you saw how it looked uh, completed uh, just a minute ago, and it, it looked actually pretty nice. So um, I just thought you'd like to see those. I am an affiliate with Topaz. You can contact me for a discount. If you use my referral code, uh, you'll get a, I think it's a 10% discount. So, um, they don't allow us to post the link to where you would get the discount. I, I think um, they prefer to know exactly where the, uh, the referrals are coming from. So you have to contact me for your discount. Let's talk about photographing in the field. Wait a minute, back up. Do you have any questions, Linda? This is from Paul Denman. He wants to know, do you crop first in Lightroom before you use Topaz? You know, I'm, I'm uh, going to say yes and no. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I, um, I guess most of the time I do the crop because there is um, less material for the software to have to deal with. Um, if you have an old slow computer, I have an old slow one and I have a very fast new one. If you have an old slow computer, you're going to find that Topaz bogs your computer down and you wait a long time while it's processing. Um, I can't believe the difference between my 10-year-old uh, iMac and my 
six month old uh, desk, uh, laptop. My laptop is super fast. They have 64 gigs of RAM. And so it, it processes very quickly. But uh, the old one, it will take a few minutes for the, for the uh, processing to take place. So yeah, I generally will crop beforehand. Okay. Um, Sue is asking a question, and since you're a Canon shooter, I'm gonna throw this at you. She wants to know, is Topaz better than Canon RAW software? You know, I can't tell you that because I haven't really used it. I've had it on my computers different times, and I think I have it on right now on, on this uh, new laptop, but I haven't, I haven't been able to compare them. No, I don't know. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's, that's it for now. Okay. Let's talk about photographing from a blind. You want to set up perches. The birds are friendly and you need to practice patience. So I think it's a good idea to work with um, getting birds, not necessarily in your hand, but um, here I am, I was setting up uh, a perch for, for birds and I had an orange in my hand and this Oreo kept flying past me and then it finally landed and it just, it made my day. So I love showing that picture. But anyway, you, you wanna set up a perch. And if you look at the background, it's nothing um, that looks really fancy or exciting, um, but the distant background will blur out, so it doesn't matter. He's around you, I'm sure. Oh, there's a uh, video. A great shot. Really needs a video. Okay, so that was just a little video clip. Once you get going, Work on still photos, learn the birds' habits. So in the springtime, uh, I like to pick a branch of aloe that grows in my yard. I planted it years ago and I have lots of it. Uh, the Rio Grande Valley is one of the aloe capitals of the world. So we have it um, in lots of fields all over the place and the birds learn to come to it. So this is just a picture of a bird coming to a still perch. Here I've got a barn swallow and it is collecting um, mud and I'm going to say debris to make its nest. And so I worked really hard to get the, um, the bird as it was lifting off his feet or off, just off the ground. His wings are spread and you can see he's grabbed a piece of long piece of um, I think it's algae with mud connected to it. This one isn't flying, but he's uh, sort of getting ready to. The uh, Pyroloxia on the left was approaching the perch and the curb bill thrasher took offense to it. And so I just happened to catch the, um, the, the moment when the Pyroloxia flipped backwards. This one isn't flying but it's um, a shrike and it's just caught a caterpillar. And this is one of the advantages of photographing in a blind. You can uh, set up a pre-focused spot and get pictures of birds as they're coming to land. This was taken from a blind, um, not, well, not a blind, I shouldn't say that, a temporary, <clears throat> temporary blind. And so the bird will, the owls will come out of the um, nest boxes in the late afternoon, early evening, and they start hunting. And that's what's happening here. This one's from a raptor blind, uh, which is sort of funny because you wouldn't expect a scissor tail flycatcher to be gathering nesting material in a raptor field. Uh, it's, it's a field, big open field that we uh, feed raptors in to attract them into one spot. And um, I should probably mention, you know, when people find out that we feed raptors, um, it raises hackles on some people, I guess. Um, but we don't feed it so they're dependent on it. We only feed a couple of times a week and it's not enough to feed all the birds. So it's just a snack that encourages them to come in. It's, it's a little bit different for raptors because they're meat eating. We use chicken skins and um, so we're not killing anything. Well, I guess we're killing chickens, but we're not killing anything to get the photos. Um, so we put out raptor bait for them. And sometimes in the spring, we get the scissor tail fly catchers come in and they're, um, this one was gathering nesting material. 
This one took offense to the caracara that was flying through. The, the caracara was flying toward the photo blind, obviously, and it passed through an area where the scissor tail flycatcher had a nest. Um, yeah, Ruth, real, real quick, um, are we looking at um, birds at the Laguna Seca Ranch? Most are of them. Most of them, okay. Yep, I, I don't um, differentiate when I'm talking because I don't think it's, it's not really relevant to what we're doing, but most of them are at Laguna Seca. Some of them are at Santa Clara, some of them are at Jones Alta Vista, and some are Martin Refuge, did I get them all? I think so, the four. So this is a cardinal and the birds and other animals love the cactus tunas when they fruit. That's the tuna is the fruit of the cactus. And so this female cardinal was flying in and she landed right on one tuna and stuck her beak in the other one. I just thought that one was pretty funny. I'm glad she still had her wings out. There's the hawk that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, I could talk about lighting and wind. I don't have special notes for that, but um, when you're photographing birds, they do fly into the wind generally. That's how they uh, take off when they're flying, and that's how they land when they're flying generally. And the bigger the bird, the more they need that wind. The smaller birds can do a jump and, and get some lift, but the bigger birds really need that wind. So this is at the raptor blind, and this um, hawk was uh, going around in circles, and I was watching him to catch him when I had the wind and the light right. The wind is coming from behind me toward it, and the light is coming from the left side just a little bit. There's the underside. When they fly over, um, when, they, when they dip the right wing, in this case, uh, the lower wing, sometimes you can uh, get some really nice lighting on the underside of them. There's going the other way. So now I've got the top side. He's banking. So again, the lighting is coming a little bit from the left and the rear, and the wind is coming from behind me, but he's circling around. So he's, he's about to bank and go the other, you know, go toward the right. There's just gliding. And, you know, it's again, knowing your subject. Um, these raptors will glide. They, they soar, they glide. Um, they, some of them will dive bomb subjects. These guys tend to hover over and then just do straight down onto this, uh, to the, uh, prey. Here he's uh, gone down and I put this in there because uh, he's so big he dwarfs the uh, the caracaras when he puts his wings out and the caracara had a little piece of meat in its beak and the white-tailed hawk just flew down right next to it and took it right out of his mouth and the caracara is just sort of standing there not sure what to do. Um, he's, he's been bullied a little bit here. Well, you take a breath. Can I oh, okay. ask some questions? Um, so both Barbara and Jamie are wondering what type of, what sort of focus point are you using? Single, zone, um, one shot, El Servo, um, I guess oh, okay. focus. Yeah, the focus. Um, I tend, I well, I do spot metering, so I have one focus point in the middle uh, but it moves, I move it around all the time. And I know with the mirrorless cameras and some of the newer cameras, they've got this um, tracking focus and I can't speak to that. I know that um, it, each camera system has a different system. And I know the Nikons have a tracking system in them, the new ones, but um, I, I just put it on uh, one stop, one spot in the middle, or sometimes I'll do the four where it's, the, it's like a plus in the middle, but I don't leave it in the middle. I move it around with my thumb as I'm photographing. So it changes. Okay. Um, David Valdez is asking, uh, what would you recommend as a good field guide book for identifying birds? Uh, ben Cowan suggested Sibley's and then uh, someone else, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who said something about, it might've been Vinith. Um, iBird Pro is a great resource. Do you have a preference or recommendation? 
Well, physical field guides, um, I have Sibley's and it, I think it, it used to be divided in uh, Eastern and Western, but I just have the big one, the big volume. And I have the, the original one, I actually prefer over the second edition because the colors are more accurate. I think they got real heavy with the ink on the second version. But um, that's my physical uh, field guide that sits on my, I've got one on my kitchen table for when I look outside at the birds out there. And I have uh, one in, in my uh, computer area. So that's what I have uh, as far as physical field guides. I have other ones too, but the, the, the go-to um, I use is Sibley's. Now I have Sibley's for my phone. And when I'm guiding, uh, often I'm teaching in the, the photo blind with uh, photographers who are visiting, especially if they're not from this area. So um, when, they, when they see a bird or I've pointed out a bird and they say, how do you say that? And I'll say pyroloxia, and uh, I get them to say it, and uh, so they learn something. And then I show them in the field guide the difference between a pyroloxia and a cardinal, and the field guide marks that you would look. Uh, the field marks, like the the beak on the pyroloxia is yellow orange, and the, on the cardinals it's orangey red. So um, I use that in the in the uh, blind to help people. And we can look at uh, bird ranges because people say, I wonder if we get those where I live. And I, we all, we look at the field guide and look at the range of the bird that we're talking about and they see that. So it's real helpful um, both at home and in the field in the, you know, when we're out photographing. Um, Sue Pitts is asking, do you have feeders? At like the range? Like, yeah, do you have feed, do you put up feeders? Oh yeah. Um, at the ranches, all of them have feeding year round. So um, each ranch is owned and operated by somebody different. So they're not all the same. Uh, at the Laguna Seca Ranch, we have morning blinds and afternoon blinds. And the feeder goes off pertaining to what that blind is. So if you're in a morning blind, uh, when you get there, you get there early and you turn off the feeder so it doesn't go off. The birds get in the habit of coming to the food. Uh, in the afternoon blinds, the, the, the feeders go off in the afternoon. So you turn it off when you get there so it doesn't go off while you're uh, photographing. At the um, Santa Clara Ranch, their feeder is out at each blind all day long. It's just free feed. And whenever um, the bird comes, there's always food. At the Jones Alta Vista, they feed every morning and every evening at both blinds. And at the Martin Refuge, um, there's food day in, day out, year round. The raptors there get fed twice a week. Okay, I think, I think we're good for a, for a minute. Well, that was the end, actually. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then how about if you guys have some questions, throw them in there. Uh, so David Valdez does have a question. Um, he wants to know, do you ever use bird calls? I do. Let me, I think I stopped sharing my screen, did I? You, uh, let's see. I, I think, think so. you did, yeah. yeah. Okay, yes, I, Go ahead. I, I do use bird calls, um, but there, again, this is, this is a, a topic that you can talk about for a long time. Uh, I would say that you have to do it appropriately and do, don't do it incessantly. The birds hear you. They don't need you to say it 10 times. They hear you the first time and they might look the second and come the third. Or if they're a shy bird, you might scare them away. So when I'm, uh, people who have been with me in the photo blind know that um, if things are slow, I'll just put out like a call for a cardinal. It's a real common bird. And sometimes when you call a cardinal, something else will show up. I mean, they, they, they hear the sounds and they associate it with other, um, other birds being there. And so they respond. So yeah, I, I will use them, but not incessantly. Now, when you're out in the field, I, it's a different story because you, when you're walking around, if you're in a, well, first of all, I don't think a lot of the parks uh, like you to do that. As a matter of fact, they might say no calling of birds. But um, if you're on private property 
and you know the property, you'll know if there's a nest around or not. You don't want to be calling a bird off its nest to answer to a call. It takes them away from their eggs or their chicks and it leaves the nest vulnerable and um, you know, points it out. Um, a learning experience. Many years ago, um, someone I know wanted to uh, see a, a vermilion flycatcher uh, nest and they went to the nest, saw the baby birds and touched them, which is a big no-no, and the next day the birds were gone. They, the, I'm sure a raccoon had smelled the human scent maybe in the tree, but you just don't you don't want to do things like that. And so calling birds is sort of the same thing. You're distracting the birds from uh, their lives. If it's not in nesting season and there's no courtship going on, I think it's a, a much better time to do it. You have to do it thinking about ethics. Yeah. So um, Marsha Ralston is asking, do you still use suet? I do. Marsha knows about my suet. Um, I make it because I make it to the consistency that works with putting on perches where it doesn't show in the pictures. So um, I use white lard that you buy from the grocery store and put half, um, you can make a small batch. I make big batches and it lasts you know, quite a while with all the guiding I do. So um, you do use, let's just say a half a cup of lard and a half a cup of smooth peanut butter you put them in a pan and just bring it to the melting point so it looks like you've got peanut butter soup. Then you add uh, equal parts of flour and cornmeal. And what that does is thicken it. And when it gets to the point where it's like, I'm gonna say thick pudding, you turn the heat off, uh, you stir it, let it cool down. And I put it in, um, you can either use like Tupperware type containers or Ziploc bags, however you want. I put them in little containers because you don't need to use a lot. But I take that with me whenever I go to uh, photograph from a blind. Okay. Um, can you repeat the names of the different ranches you were talking about earlier? I can do that. Um, the Laguna Seca Ranch is the one that I spend most of my time at, but I also guide at the Santa Clara Ranch, uh, the Martin Refuge, and the Jones Alta Vista Ranch. Okay. Um, I am looking through, and I think that is all the questions we have for you. Um, I'll just start asking my selfish questions now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so can you, uh, David Valdez is asking for your email. Would you mind sharing that here? Yeah, Ruth at RuthHoyt.com is the easiest one to say. Okay. Ruth at RuthHoyt.com or RuthHoyt at gmail.com, either one. Okay. So my selfish question is, you know, it's really difficult for me to get down to South, South Texas. Do you have any, um, do you ever come up here? Do you have any favorite spots in Texas that could kind of spread out so people have some options for if we can't go deep south? Do you have a place on the coast that you like to go? How about somewhere in West Texas? Just to give us some ideas of good birding places. Well, any place along the coast is good. I mean, Galveston, High Island, Port Aransas, um, Port, uh, um, well, South Padre Island, North Padre Island, um, all along the coast, you can pretty much go anywhere and find good birds. I don't get to photograph the, the, the water birds so much as the the brush country birds. But yeah, any place along the coast is great. And the um, state parks are wonderful. Uh, a lot of times they'll have photo blinds set up and they're not ideal as far as the way we do it on the private ranches, but it gives you good opportunities to mm -hmm. see the birds and, and at least practice until you come to South Texas. Yeah. Um, so Susan Hansen is asking, do you have any suggestions for photographing birds in dense canopy. Okay, I didn't hear that because my, sure. my uh, Wi-Fi cut out, sorry. Sure, uh, Susan Hansen is asking, do you have suggestions for photographing birds in dense canopy? That is tricky. Um, if you're talking about something like Costa Rica, uh, we used flash when we were down there. And um, I don't use a whole lot of flash for my bird photography, but when you're working in dark canopy, 
you, you've got to do something. Now with the higher ISO uh, capabilities of the cameras and, and software that um, associated with it, uh, I would just raise my ISO and get as close as you can to the birds. Use fill flash, um, but I don't like to use a whole lot of flash. If you, if you, if you use flash, um, I, I have my camera with my lens and on the lens bracket, I have a bracket that puts, um, puts my flash way above the camera, about, um, well, a couple of feet maybe, 18 inches to two feet. And what that does is separates the flash from the, uh, the lens, the way it sees the birds. So you don't get the moon eye or red eye, you know, the, the, the glare from the flash on the bird's eye, just a little catch light. Okay, so, I, okay, so this is two questions. Eileen Harding is asking, <clears throat> Excuse me. Are each of the ranches known for particular birds? And then Janet Lewis is asking, when is the best time to come to these ranches? If you want to come, um, if you want to come to the ranches, do you book with a ranch or with someone else? Uh, well, each, like I said before, each ranch is owned and operated differently. So um, I guide on all four of those ranches that I mentioned. So if you're interested in having me as a guide, you would contact me directly but you can go to each ranch's website um, and contact them. There's a difference because, uh, well, the price won't be this different, but you won't know who the guide is going to be for sure. Uh, and it can change. So uh, if you want to come with me, contact me. If you want to just do general questions and make a reservation, you can contact the ranch uh, directly. And um, for Eileen's question, are each of the ranches known for particular birds? Oh yeah, I forgot to answer that. That's all right. Um, well, I'm going to say the Jones Alta Vista Ranch is the farthest west, and that one has Chihuahua ravens, which is different because I've never seen a Chihuahua raven at any of the other three ranches. Um, the Martin Refuge sometimes has scaled quail, which um, those are more of a western bird. Uh, so each ranch, uh, the Roadrunners at the Santa Clara are unbelievable, um, but um, I'm going to say each one, we have great barn owls at the uh, Laguna Seca. Um, we, we have all the valley specialties, I would say. And uh, David Valdez and Jane Atlas want to know, is there a better season for birding? When's the best time to come to these ranches? I'm going to say any time except... July, August, September. It's very hot down here. And if you're not accustomed to the heat, you're not going to have fun. Um, and most of the birds, but not all, are molting in July, August, and September. And by October, they look beautiful again. So um, I would say anytime October through June. Okay. And the, uh, the high season would be from mid March to mid-May, that's when you see the most, um, the highest number of migratory birds coming through. So they stop at the ranches and you get a little bit more variety during those couple of months. That's the hardest time to get a reservation because it books fast. Okay, uh, so going, I'm sorry, going back to the ranch, do you, are people allowed to stay at the ranch or are they staying at outlying little towns? Each ranch is different. So at the Jones Alta Vista and the Santa Clara, they have accommodations. At the Martin Refuge, you meet uh, Patty or me at the gate in the morning. Um, at the Laguna Seca, there are no accommodations, but uh, Edinburgh is just 20 miles away, right down the highway. So it's a 20 minute drive. Okay, um, so one technical question here. Uh, Scott wants to know, is this on-camera flash and not triggered external? Do you know what he's asking? I do know what he's asking. Um, you can take your, uh, I don't have a flash on my camera. The pro models just don't have them for the most part. Uh, you have to buy an external flash and it goes on top of your camera. So, um, but you can take this camera, uh, this, uh, this setup, take the flash off of the camera and set it, um, either on a bracket or use a remote. So I have a, a, a trigger or a wireless uh, trigger system. You put the little um, device on top of the camera in the hot shoe where the flash goes and it triggers the flash. So you can put the flash anywhere you want. So I tend to use off camera flash. 
Okay. Ruth, this was another great little session and I appreciate you coming in and, and doing this. I know you just, every time I talk to you, it's birds, birds, birds. And, and uh, I always have these random questions and you're always very, very generous with your time and you reply back. So I really appreciate it. Um, let's plug your Zoom meetup and that is coming up, I believe this. Yes, Sunday. I've got, I've got a Zoom uh, coming up this Sunday at two o'clock central time. So you go from there. If you're interested in attending, you'll need to get the password and link to join from me. You can either write to ruth at ruthhoyt.com or ruthhoyt at gmail.com. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna put my phone number out there. You can find <laughs> it on my website though. It's on okay. my website. All right, well, I will probably see you, uh, see you on Sunday, so send me that link. Okay, so next week, Douglas Stratton, who is a fine art travel photographer based in Atlanta, will join us to present passion for the art of photography. Douglas is going to pose those questions to explore authenticity with our passion and knowing who we are as photographers, so please join us next Wednesday. If you would, please go to his website, check out some of his photos. They are absolutely stunning. And I think he's going to inspire you guys. I know that we're not traveling at the moment, but as soon as we do, we're going to hit the, hit the road running. Um, I'm going to close it out for tonight. And thank you guys for coming. And I hope to see you next week.